they could be called X-planets. Two worlds with such extreme conditions, they make the wildest in our own solar system seem normal by comparison. Our Earth is really a pretty pleasant place compared to the other planets in the solar system. Even the hottest day in the Sahara Desert is downright chilly compared to the molten lead temperatures on the surface of Venus. And the worst Category 5 hurricane? It's hardly a dust devil next to the Earth-sized cyclones in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Could there be other worlds out there with even wilder weather than we see in our solar system? Astronomers using NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope think they found two that are all that and more. Instead of exoplanets, let's call these exoplanets because they have the most extreme conditions we've ever seen. Their official names, HD 149026b and HD 189733b, are based on the catalog numbers of their host stars. Personally, I'm going to call them something unofficial but easier to remember. Cyclops and Storm, the hottest and windiest known planets. Both of them are so-called hot Jupiters, a class of gas giants like the outer planets in our solar system. But their orbits would fall well inside that of Mercury, and that makes them hot. It also makes their years short, taking only two or three Earth days to orbit their stars. Our first exoplanet, Cyclops, can be found in the constellation Hercules, orbiting a sun-like star that's about 250 light years away. Its day side is a blistering 2300 degrees Kelvin, according to infrared Spitzer observations made by astronomer Dr. Joe Harrington and his team. That's a lot hotter than the inside of a blast furnace and sets the record for known planetary temperatures. If we could actually see it, this Saturn-sized world wouldn't look like anything in our solar system. To reach such a high temperature, astronomers calculate that its atmosphere must absorb nearly all the radiation from its nearby star. It's probably as black as this lump of coal. The only light from it would be the thermal emission from its sunward-facing hotspot. Cyclops may indeed look like a giant black eyeball with a glowing iris. A little closer to home, our other exoplanet, Storm, can be found in the constellation Volpecula at a distance of 63 light years. A team led by Dr. Heather Knudsen carefully studied how Storm's brightness varied over the course of its orbit and derived the first ever temperature map for an exoplanet. Unlike Cyclops, where the hotspot sits directly under the baking heat of its sun, on Storm, it's shifted away by about 30 degrees. The researchers deduce this shift is caused by ferocious winds in the upper atmosphere that sweep the hot clouds around the planet before they can cool off much. The wind speeds could be as high as 9,600 kilometers an hour, or 6,000 miles an hour. That's about 30 times faster than the jet streams in Earth's atmosphere. Storm's day side is about half as hot as Cyclops but its night side only drops a couple hundred degrees due to the winds redistributing the heat. So how can we gather weather reports from worlds we can't even see directly? They're so far away, their faint glow is completely blurred together with the much brighter light of their host stars. It's like trying to study a tennis ball that's next to a searchlight. That's 100 miles away using binoculars. Fortunately for astronomers, both Cyclops and Storm are transiting systems. Their planetary orbits are aligned nearly edge-on along our line of sight. When they transit in front of their stars, we can learn a lot about them by measuring how much starlight they block. But while stars are brightest in visible light, planets emit most of their light in the infrared. Proportionally, this makes a big difference. They may still only account for less than a percent of the total light of the system, but amazingly, that's enough for Spitzer's infrared detectors to measure. These measurements are making astronomers the first interstellar weathermen. The 2007 record highs go to Cyclops, and the record winds were logged on Storm. But records seldom last, and exoplanetary weather is a young field. 
Fortunately, Spitzer will remain a powerful tool for studying exoplanets even after it runs out of coolant at the end of its primary mission. Expect to hear about hotter, windier, and even stranger exoplanets in the coming years. For the Spitzer Science Center, I'm Dr. Robert Hurt, reminding you there's a hidden and extreme universe just waiting to be discovered. The Infrared Astronomical Satellite, now celebrating its 25th anniversary, gave us the first all-sky view of our dusty infrared universe. Floating above the galactic center is the Rho Ophiuchi Cloud. About 400 light years away, it's one of the more spectacular nearby star forming regions. NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope has now given us an impressive new view of this cloud's central core. Compact yellow-green arcs and filaments are shock fronts from protostellar jets within the cloud. These jets shoot out from young stars still growing as they gobble up the surrounding dust and gas. Here we see infrared light with wavelengths from 3.6 to 8 microns. Widening the coverage to include 24 microns yields an even richer array of colors that shed light on the temperature and composition of the dust here. The cloud is named after the nearby star Rho Ophiuchi, which ironically is not thought to be associated with the star forming region and does not appear in the Spitzer image. Also known as Linz 1688, this region contains over 300 baby stars with ages of up to a few hundred thousand years. The dusty envelopes around the youngest stars make them appear red in this rendering. In visible light, they can't be seen at all, which is why astronomers rely on Spitzer's infrared perspective to help study the hidden universe. Stars are born in gravitationally collapsing clouds of gas, shrouded in dark natal blankets of dust. Peering inside, using the infrared eye of NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, reveals surprising jet-like structures that tell us something about how stars form. A baby star grows in size and mass by accumulating material from an orbiting disk. A small amount never reaches the protostar, but is spun up and ejected along its polar magnetic fields, perpendicular to the disk. These jets become visible where they crash into the surrounding interstellar gas, making glowing shock fronts that sometimes look like vast, elongated bubbles. In other cases, we may only see the shocked gas at the very tips of the jets, far from their originating protostars. Visible light images can sometimes show hints of jets that are more fully revealed by Spitzer's observations. In other cases, they can only be seen in the infrared. Kinks in the jets show astronomers how the direction of the outflow can change over time, tracing different paths through the surrounding material. These colorful images of protostellar jets provide important clues about how stars, like our own sun, grow and evolve in the hidden universe. When a massive star reaches the end of its life, it explodes dramatically, and for a few months can outshine everything else in the galaxy. But the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant is a bit of a mystery. Astronomers have concluded it should have been visible sometime in the late 17th century, but there are no clear historical references to it. Earlier supernova had been seen by many, often shining brighter than the planets. Of course, with no witnesses and no records, 
it's awfully difficult to determine exactly what kind of supernova this one was. A team led by astronomer Oliver Krause has, over the last few years, made a remarkable series of infrared observations of the region. The Spitzer Space Telescope images show shifting patterns of glowing dust beyond the remnant itself. These changes are so fast, they indicate motion at the speed of light. To get what's happening, we have to remember that light is fast. But in such a huge galaxy, it still takes a while for it to get anywhere. Cass A is 11,000 light years away, which means that we're seeing it today the way it was 11,000 years ago. But that's only part of the story. Light from a supernova can even take hundreds of years to reach surrounding dust clouds. Following the arrows of light, it's clear we'll see the supernova flash first. The light echoing off the dust clouds will arrive later at various times, delayed by hundreds of years from the original flash. So we're not seeing the dust move. We're seeing the light from the supernova move through the dust. Out there, the flash is about as bright as the light of the full moon, which is enough to warm the dust ever so slightly. Spitzer, in turn, can observe this brief jump in its thermal infrared glow. Now, knowing the location of the infrared light echo, Dr. Krause and his team went searching for a far more elusive, visible light echo. Using the powerful Subaru telescope in Hawaii, they succeeded in measuring the very faint light of the supernova itself reflecting off the dust. The light echo has acted like an astronomical time machine, letting us study the original supernova using instruments that were beyond imagination in the 17th century. By matching its visible light spectral signature to a well-studied supernova in a nearby galaxy, Krause and his team have identified it as a so-called Type 2b supernova. A Type 2b is fainter than the earlier Type 1b supernovas noted by Tycho Brahe in 1572 and Johannes Kepler in 1604. Interestingly, the Royal Astronomer Flamsteed noted a star near Casse in August of 1680 with a brightness consistent with a Type 2b supernova at that distance. So, maybe it was seen after all. But this light echo also reveals more than just the supernova. The expanding flash also lets astronomers study the three-dimensional structure of the dust by illuminating it one slice at a time. If we combine the images, assigning colors to the observation dates, the result is a prismatic display of the 3D dust structure. The nearest dust is blue, and the most distant is red, while everything that stays constant is gray. We can see that the interstellar dust lies in sheets and filaments, not, for instance, big puffy clouds. This remarkable light echo around Cass A has led to a better understanding of both supernovas and interstellar dust, which itself is made of elements that were forged in previous generations of supernovas. This also marks the start of our third year of Hidden Universe podcasts. On behalf of the staff here at the Spitzer Science Center, I'd like to thank all our viewers for helping make this and our other podcasts so successful. And do keep watching, because there's a lot more of this hidden universe just waiting to be discovered.